guys, Camry here. I'm chilling in my sweet loft courtesy of National Geographic Kids. So, when was the last time you guys actually knew how something worked? And no, I do not mean Googling it. I mean really learned how something worked. One thing I've always been wondering about is how submarines work. How do these ginormous machines go underwater and above the water in the ocean? And how do you even start to build one? Unfortunately, National Geographic Kids has sent me my own expert to help me figure out these questions. This one got mailed straight to my loft. Whoa. Thanks, Camry. Good to see daylight again. I'm David Gruber, marine biologist. So David, how do submarines go underwater? Typical submarines are built with two hulls. Think of it like two layers of skin with a space in between them. The space between the hulls contains what we call the ballast tanks. Got it. When the crew of a submarine wants to dive, they fill the ballast tanks with water, increasing the density of the sub. So denser objects sink? Exactly. And when the crew wants to rise? They force air into the tank to displace the water, making it lighter. You got it. Air is much lighter than water, so a submarine filled with air naturally becomes more buoyant. Buoyancy describes an object's floatability. So if I take a giant deep breath, I become more buoyant? Correct. Okay, so once a submarine is actually underwater, how does anyone know where they're going? Submarines rely on a system called sonar to navigate. Sonar stands for... Acronym pose. Sound, navigation, and ranging. Okay, I've heard of that before. They send sound waves through the ocean, right? Exactly. The key is receiving the reflected echo of the sound. Sound waves bounce off objects, so a submarine crew gauges what's around them by determining how long it takes to echo back to them. So the shorter the time, the closer the object. That's it. OK, so a submarine is like a giant half whale, half bat with two holes. Air and water fill the ballast tanks between the holes to bring it up and down. It sends sound waves throughout the ocean to know where other objects are. I can't believe I went through like many years of graduate school to learn that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming by. My pleasure. Hey, guys, Camry here chilling in the sweet loft. So today, instead of looking at another piece of technology, I thought we'd check out something amazing in nature, like my pet gecko, Apollo. He climbs on just about anything, but his feet don't have any talons, claws, or hooks. He doesn't even leave a slime trail. To be honest, I have no idea how he's even staying to that wall. Time to get some help from National Geographic Kids. Nat Geo Kids Expert Vending Machine. Hmm, more expensive than I remember. Hey, Camry. Hey. I'm David Gruber. How can I help today? How do geckos climb everything on just their plain feet? Every gecko's foot has a secret. If you look closely, their feet aren't so plain. Let's check out my high-resolution photos of gecko feet. Whoa, these are cool. I love collecting photos of geckos. They are amazing. Thanks. Anyway, each toe of a gecko foot is packed with millions of tiny hair-like structures called setae. These hairs allow them to cling to almost any surface. I've got a ton of hair, but I don't cling to anything. That's because your hair isn't the same as a gecko's. Sete are way thinner, one-tenth the size of a human hair, and they're specifically designed to stick to surfaces. Maybe we should get a closer look on Apollo's feet. Great idea. Whoa, Apollo Sete have a life of their own. I wish my hair waved like that. Don't we all? There's a reason for this movement. Whenever Apollo takes a step, the sete flatten to make close contact with the surface. To create a larger area of contact with the wall? Exactly. Now check out the tips of the hairs. On the tip of each hair are hundreds of split ends. Ugh, I hate split ends. Yeah, but geckos love them. The split ends fan out to grip the surface. The grip of a single strand isn't strong, but all of them together can keep Apollo clinging wherever he wants to go. Where is he going, anyway? I think under the radiator. We should get out of here. Cool, let's go. Hey, guys, it's Camry. My friends and I are having a movie night, and I'm making some popcorn. Popcorn is just one of those weird things that I always took for granted. How does it pop? And why does it transform from a crunchy kernel to fluffy white popcorn? I'm going to need some help for this. Thankfully, National Geographic Kids sent me their expert in popcorn popping. Here she is now. Hey, Camry. 
I'm Asha J, a National Geographic explorer and a creative conservationist. My friends call me the Popcorn Pilgrim. I'm always looking for kernels like yourself to transform. Really? Yes, I used to be in fashion and I'm a big fan of instant makeovers. Popcorn is an instant makeover if I ever saw one. Okay, so what are popcorn kernels? Are they just dried up pieces of corn? A popcorn kernel is corn, just a different species of corn than what we eat at a barbecue. A kernel of popcorn has a stronger shell, or hull, which makes it better at trapping steam. How does trapping steam make a popcorn kernel pop? Each of these kernels is like nature's little pressure cooker. When heat is added to the seeds, the moisture inside them turns to steam, filling the inside of the kernel. Like a tea kettle. Exactly. Except the steam has nowhere to go. Because of the kernel's strong hold. Bingo. Eventually, enough steam pressure builds inside the kernel that it bursts through the kernel's shell. So is the popping the sound of the shell breaking? It's actually the sound of steam rushing out of the kernel, kind of like the popping sound of opening a soda bottle. So what's the white stuff of popcorn? That stuff is the starch of the kernel. It's stored food the seed consumes to grow into a sprout. Popcorn is just amazing. To get a better perspective, I think we'll have to see one of those kernels up close and personal. Yes. Wait, what? We'll just enlarge a popcorn seed and see how it all works. Stand back. Amazing. OK, this is the seed's hull. It protects the seed. And also traps the steam. This is the endosperm. It's the starch that is the seed's fuel to grow into a plant. So when the kernel pops, it bursts out of the shell and becomes the fluffy, tasty part of popcorn. And this is the seed's germ. It's the part of the plant that would develop if the seed were to grow on its own. It's getting hot in here, like a sauna. That's the steam building inside the shell. Wait, that means this kernel's ready too. Whoa! This is so trippy. I could stare at this lava lamp for hours. <laughs> Wake up, Camry. What exactly is a lava lamp? Is this even lava? And how does the lamp create such mesmerizing floating globs? To shed some light on this lamp, I brought on the help of an expert. There she is now. Whoa, Ruby Loft, far out. Thanks. Are you my expert? Yeah, I'm Asha J, a National Geographic explorer and a creative conservationist who knows her lava lamps. They're beautiful examples of how science blends with creativity. Now, let's see your lamps. Hypnotic, aren't they? Yeah. So, first question, am I actually looking at lava? Nope. Lava is just a marketing name corporations give it. You're looking at two substances floating in harmony. How exactly do they float in harmony? To build a true lava lamp, your substances need to have different densities. So one substance will sink to the bottom. The other, and this is my favorite, immiscibility. What's immiscibility? It's a fancy science term meaning unmixable. The two substances in a lava lamp are typically water-based liquid and a waxy compound. They can never dissolve into each other. You can see it at home when you combine oil and vinegar. They never truly blend into each other. Yet they taste great on a sandwich. All right, I see how two immiscible substances form the blobs in the lamp, but how do they rise up and down? That comes from the power of your lamp's magic light bulb. Magic light bulb? OK, it's a normal light bulb, but the heat from the bulb brings the magic. The heat causes the blobs of wax to rise. As they get further away from the bulb, they cool. Then they fall back down to the bulb, and the cycle begins all over again. Why does the heat cause them to rise? For that, we'd have to view the blobs on a molecular level. And there's no way we could possibly. We could use my molecular shrink ray. Yeah, we could do that. Honey, let's shrink us kids. These must be the molecules of the lava lamp's blobs. As the blob heats up, the molecules spread apart, lowering its density. And a less dense blob will float towards the top. Exactly. Now watch. 
see how the blob cools off? The molecules pack closer together. It's making the blob more dense. It's amazing to look at a lava lamp from inside its own molecules. Yes. Can we go home now? Camry. 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 <laughs>
The computer then looks at your digital model, slices it up into layers, just like icing on the cake. Once it knows right where to put the icing, it tells the printer to squeeze out on that exact spot until the whole model is built just like your blueprints. Wow, thanks so much for your help, Cody. You truly are one of a kind. Hi, Camry. I'm Cody Goldhahn, mechanical engineer. How can I help you? Uh, I didn't know you had a twin. <laughs> Digital cameras, we use them every day. They're in our pockets, on our phones, but do we actually know how they work? How does a digital camera take this and make it this? Oh, hey, where did, are you my expert? Actually, I am Tom O'Brien, the photo engineer for National Geographic Magazine. So you're like the perfect person to explain how all these cameras work. Well, I don't know about perfect, but let's take a look at this camera. When you press the shutter button, the shutter opens, allowing the light to stream through the aperture of the camera's lens to the camera's eye. So when I hit the shutter button, it's like pulling back a curtain to let the light come in and hit the eye? Yes, but only for a small amount of time. The camera only needs a little bit of light to capture a moment. But how does it record the image? The camera's eye, or sensor as we call it, perceives the light as electrical signals. To demonstrate this, let's take a photo. All right, I got this. Selfie. Cute. Indeed. Now this is what your camera first saw. Whoa. These are the electrical inputs of the light. Oh, like pixels in a video game? Yes. That's your camera's electrical signal of the incoming light. After your camera collects the signal, it encodes it all as data. Like computer data. Yes, this carries the measurements of each pixel, every pixel's color and brightness. So the more pixels a camera renders from light, the more detail in the photo. Totally. We call this detail resolution. However, when a subject moves too quickly for the camera's shutter, it can appear blurry in the photo. Huh, let's try this. Yeah, right? let's. OK. Huh, definitely blurry. Maybe increase the shutter speed this time. Ready? Yes. Much better. Tom? 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 Hey guys, it's Cameron. I'm here studying for this history exam. We're learning about medieval military machines called trebuchets. They're like fancy catapults that threw all sorts of things over castle walls. Rocks, fiery cannonballs, or flaming liquids. Cool, huh? I've asked Nat Geo to send me someone to help me study. Did someone say medieval military machines? You got here fast. Tom, mechanical engineer and medieval machinery enthusiast. Camry, high school student. I'm studying trebuchets. Ah, beautiful machine. And I wanted to know how it generates the force to throw a boulder. Well, trebuchets consist of a lever and a sling. When the lever rotates, it swings around the fulcrum. As the long end of the lever nears the apex of its arc, the sling whips around over the top, opens up and releases a projectile. So if the trebuchet used heavy rocks as ammunition, how did anyone rotate the lever? A team of soldiers would yank down on the short end of the lever with ropes, accelerating the long end and creating kinetic energy to launch the projectile. So what is that? That is a counterweight trebuchet far larger than its person-powered cousin. The counterweight trebuchet relied on a massive box filled with dirt, sand, and stones. The box is hoisted into the air, and the trebuchet is cocked with a pin, creating loads of potential energy. Removing the pin allows the box to fall, throwing boulders hundreds of feet through the air. So soldiers would use these to throw rocks? And flaming liquids. And flaming liquids. Let's demo. Yeah. Ready? Whoa! <laughs> So sorry. It's okay, it's Nat Geo Kids window. So why would one object go further than another one on the same trebuchet? The greater an object's mass, the greater the force needed to move it. Thus, if two different rocks are launched by the same trebuchet, the stone with the lesser mass will travel further. Thanks for your help. I think I'm gonna do great on my exam. You're quite welcome, Camry. Now, if you'll excuse me, someone needs my help building a battering ram. Onward! For your moonlighting astronomers with out-of-this-world dreams. Fuel their curiosity with Nat Geo Kids. <laughs>